I can't support you anymore. I'm sorry I can't believe in you at a time like this. I'm John, 32 years old. Today, I'm divorcing my wife, Emily, who became paralyzed from the waist down in an accident. Everyone will probably say I'm abandoning my wife in her time of need. But there's been a lot leading up to this point. We've been struggling for years to have children. Once we decided to get fertility tests at a specialized clinic, we discovered it was her side issue, making it less likely for us to have a child. Emily cried and apologized to me every day. I didn't know what to say to her, and we both became depressed. During these dark days, more misfortune struck us. We met in a college ski club. On the bus to the ski camp with club members. Is this seat taken? Uh, please, have a seat. Emily, a junior member, sat next to me. We quickly got close, talking about skiing. And even after returning from the camp, we started meeting up and hanging out at college. Three years after graduating from college, we get married and were blessed by our friends from the club. Life should have been perfect, but we couldn't have a child. Five years into our marriage, and still no child, Emily began to panic. Hey, Claire from our club is becoming a mom. Now I'm the only one from our circle without a kid. That was all she talked about recently. But there wasn't much we could do about it. So, we bravely went to a fertility clinic to find out if there was any problem. But the Dr. Alexander's words were harsh. There's nothing wrong with you, sir. However, your wife has severe endometriosis. It's difficult for her to conceive in this condition. I was stunned listening to the Dr. Alexander speak so matter-of-factly. Tears didn't even come to my eyes. It was so unexpected. Emily lost all her spirit, knowing the issue was with her, and remained depressed even at home. Will I never be a mom? I dreamt of having a barbecue with you, me, and our child. I hugged and consoled her, who kept repeating I'm sorry in my arms. Whether we have children or not, I'm happy as long as I'm with you. Let's take our time and figure out our future together. I wasn't sure if she was convinced, but I expressed my feelings as best as I could. Emily nodded, but she still seemed troubled. Time passed, and it was December. The city sparkled with Christmas lights, a season of excitement for everyone. But for us, it was just another gloomy day. Even after finishing my busy year-end work, coming home to a depressed Emily made me feel suffocated. I wanted children too, but if it wasn't meant to be, I was content building a happy home with just Emily and me. I understand Emily's feelings well enough, but it's tough on me too. Gradually, our relationship started to falter, changing from it can be helped to enough is enough. Our marriage was deteriorating, but there was nothing we could do about it. Perhaps realizing things couldn't go on like this, Emily decided to go on a trip with her girlfriends for a change of scenery. I readily agreed, telling her to go and refresh herself. I just wanted her to become more positive. But I would later regret not forcibly stopping her, as she got involved in a major trouble that would change the course of her life. At that time, I had no way of knowing that Emily would be caught up in such a significant incident that would affect her future. Her destination was Colorado. Packing her ski gear, she said she was going to enjoy skiing in hot springs with friends. She was looking forward to stopping by Aspen on the way back, a place that held fond memories for us since that's where we had our wedding. Feeling relieved after seeing Emily off, I focused on work at the office. That's when I received a call from an unfamiliar number. Hello, is this John's phone? I apologize for the sudden call. This is the Colorado State Police. I'm calling about your wife, Emily. She was involved in an accident. Her car slipped on the snow. I'll give you the details of the hospital, the officer explained. Shocked, I hastily informed my boss and rushed out of the office. Emily, who waved goodbye so cheerfully, in an accident. A slip on the snow. 
It couldn't be a minor injury if the call wasn't from Emily herself. All I could hope for was her survival as I boarded the train to Aspen. When I stepped off at Aspen Station, a cold wind hit my face like a slab, surrounded by a blanket of snow. Completely different from the scenery in New York, I huddled up due to the cold. I caught a taxi waiting at the station's roundabout and rushed to the hospital. Arriving at the hospital in a panic, I was greeted by several nurses and police officers. John, your wife is currently in the ICU. A nurse said that, leading me to where Emily was. Through the ICU glass, I saw Emily, her body connected to numerous tubes, and I immediately realized the gravity of the situation, my anxiety intensifying. The reality in front of me crushed all my hopes that this was a lie. Tears streamed down my face, too overwhelmed to wipe them away. After the nurses finished explaining, two police officers started their briefing. John, can we explain the details of the accident? Their hesitant manner made me uneasy. Your wife was with a male passenger. Were you aware of that? I was stunned, hardly believing what I was hearing. A man. Emily. No, I thought she was with girlfriends. Is that not the case? That was all I could manage to ask. Emily meeting another man. I was certain she had planned a trip with her girlfriends, but now she was involved in an accident with a lover. Seeing my silence, the officers seemed flustered. If you weren't aware, it's okay. Thankfully, the male passenger only had minor injuries and has already been discharged. Now, all we can do is wait for your wife's condition to stabilize. They said and left. Left behind, I sat on a bench, my head in my hands. What was going on? What was Emily doing? Why did she lie to me? I must have sat there dazed for quite some time. Then, from a distance, I faintly heard someone calling. Is Emily's husband here? She's regained consciousness. Hearing the nurse's voice eager to share the good news, I snapped back to reality. Hurrying to Emily's side, I saw her in pain, trying to tell me something. John, I'm really sorry. She murmured this to me, barely conscious. It's okay, don't worry. Stay strong, Emily. I encouraged her frantically, forgetting what the police officer had told me. Later, I was called by Dr. Shelton for an explanation. Can Emily, can my wife recover fully? I asked apprehensively. Dr. Shelton gave a grim explanation. Unfortunately, your wife has sustained a severe spinal injury. It's highly likely she'll be paralyzed from the waist down. So, she won't be able to live as before. Most likely, she'll need a wheelchair. Given her current condition, I was prepared, but it was still a major injury that involved a risk to life. Actually, it was almost a miracle that she survived. I felt utterly devastated as it plunged into darkness. Since then, I visited Emily in the hospital every weekend, supporting her through rehabilitation. When she could eat by herself, I mustered up the courage to ask her something that had been troubling me. Emily, I need to ask you something. Who were you with on the day of the accident? Emily froze for a moment, clearly troubled. I'm sorry, I can tell you, it was someone I shouldn't have been with. I did something really foolish. Finally. Emily made a statement that seemed like an admission of her affair. And that single sentence became the decisive factor in my decision to divorce. I had planned to support her, regardless of her physical challenges, if she had been innocent. But if she had betrayed me, I couldn't imagine spending the rest of my life with her. I finally brought up divorce. She was shocked, but ultimately agreed. Only her father, my father-in-law tried to persuade me to reconsider. Despite his repeated pleas, I politely refused and decided to divorce. Emily and I, who had once loved each other so deeply and married. Yet, when it came to parting, it was all severed abruptly. Three years have passed since I divorced Emily. It took a long time to recover. Ever since that day, Christmas time, with its bright lights and festive mood, 
became a trauma for me. I would sigh, looking at the happy couples, trying not to be a nuisance as I walked by. Feeling pitiful and miserable, I was suddenly stopped by a stranger. Excuse me, are you John? Suddenly, I was stopped by an unfamiliar man. Turning around, I saw a man I had never met before. This is our first meeting. I'm a childhood friend of your ex-wife, Emily. Emily. That was a name I hadn't heard in a long time, and I was both surprised and confused. Sorry, actually, I was the man she came to meet in Aspen that day. His revelation hit me like a hammer. What? This man was with Emily. His sudden confession boiled my blood. What do you mean? You've turned my life upside down. Emily's condition is irreversible. How dare you approach me? I held my breath, surprising myself with how calmly yet forcefully I confronted the man. I had to restrain myself, or I might have lashed out with a punch. Everything had changed since that day. I've regretted it many times. All because of this man. Getting angry is understandable, but please calm down and listen. There's likely a misunderstanding because Emily didn't explain everything. Sensing my mood, the man also cautiously braced himself. First, my name is Nathan. I'm Emily's childhood friend and a practicing doctor in Aspen. The man named Nathan said while handing me his business card and then began to explain the situation back then. It turned out that Emily had consulted Nathan about her fertility issues. When Nathan told her about a fertility specialist in Aspen, Emily had asked him to refer her, and he wrote her a referral letter. Emily thought I would oppose the treatment because I had been hesitant about fertility treatment. Nathan explained. She lied about the trip to secretly visit the doctor Nathan referred her to. Today, I came to this city for a conference, and by chance, I saw you. I recognized you immediately, having seen your wedding photo with Emily. I've always been sworn to secrecy by Emily, but I'm glad I decided to tell you. I would have regretted it for the rest of my life if I hadn't spoken to you today. Nathan repeatedly pleading with me to meet Emily. You should hear the circumstances from her and resolve this misunderstanding, he urged. I was overwhelmed by the sudden revelation, but eventually nodded deeply agreeing to visit Emily's family home. The weekend after hearing Nathan's story, I took a train and finally arrived at Emily's family home. Standing at the front door, unsure of what to do, I hesitated for a while. But I really wanted to hear the explanation from Emily herself. Gathering my courage, I rang the doorbell. The leisurely chime sounded indifferent to my feelings, and after a while, the door opened. Who is it? For a moment, I was confused as I heard a voice but saw no one until I lowered my gaze significantly and saw Emily in a wheelchair. John, it's been a while, sorry for coming unannounced. I was relieved to see Emily looking well. Emily was beyond surprised by my visit, frozen in place. After getting used to moving her wheelchair, she led me to the living room. I met Nathan by chance who happens to be your childhood friend, and he told me everything. Is it true that you went to Aspen that day for fertility treatment? I asked. Emily bit her lip and nodded. Why didn't you consult me beforehand? As I tried to understand the situation, tears began to overflow from Emily's eyes. You said it was okay for us to live together, just the two of us, but I still wanted to have our child. I couldn't give up on that. But after my reckless actions led to my condition, I couldn't ask you to take care of me. Not only can I not have children, but now I require lifelong care. I thought it was better for us to part ways, believing you would surely be happier that way. As if the switch had been flipped, she began to speak. It seemed like she was trying to release all the feelings she had been holding back, along with her tears. She hadn't kept it a secret out of malice. If it weren't for the accident, she would have just visited the doctor introduced by her childhood friend. She probably felt unable to bring it up. She didn't deny the infidelity suspicion, accepting it instead. That was her way of showing her love, 
considering her now disabled condition. I was lost for words, looking up to see Emily's father standing behind her. I'm so sorry for what we put you through, John. I knew about it too, but as a parent, it was unbearable to see my daughter face a lonely future with her disability. Please forgive us, he said. Facing them, I straightened up. I'm also responsible. Emily was suffering, and I was insensitive to say that it was okay not to have children. We should have explored more possibilities that we both could agree on, I admitted. Reaching out, I held Emily's hands resting on her lap. I'm so sorry for leaving you alone, Emily. I apologized from my heart. Kneeling in front of Emily in her wheelchair, holding her hands, I was like a knight seeking forgiveness from his princess. Now, I understand what you were saying. Even with a body that can't bear children, I should have thought of ways to make you happy as your wife. I should have genuinely appreciated that you stayed by my side and changed. Emily also opened up to me about her honest feelings now. Finally, we were both able to express our reflections and regrets. And so, we were able to correct the years-long mistake of mismatched buttons. Several years later, we remarried. We both regretted the divorce and still had love for each other. It's not easy, but I want to try again. Ira proposed to Emily, pledging my love to her. Emily was happy but remained puzzled until the end by her need for care. I faced each of her fears one by one, discussing solutions together. We renovated our home for accessibility, and when I'm not around, we rely on a caretaker. Even if we can't have children, we wanted to live together. With that shared desire, we finally took the step forward. I am determined not to leave Emily's feelings behind again, but to firmly support her.